Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well today. My name is Brenly Mogul Rotman. I'm going to be one of your moderators today. In the background with me is Mitch Hockenberg. He'll be co-moderating. We are very excited to have you on our first webinar of the year called Stand for More. I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Grant. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, welcome to our webinar on standing and uh, how we can all stand for more. My name is Grant Brogan. I'm a part of the Permobile marketing team. I'm so honored to be a part of this panel discussion. I wanted to just introduce our other panelists. So we have Ashley Detterbeck, our very own talented clinical education manager from the great state of Wisconsin. Uh, Joseph Loretto, a published author, radio contributor, and standing wheelchair user. Nicole Labarge, who specializes in wheelchair seating and mobility assessments, as well as working with patients who have experienced traumatic brain injuries. She also has experience working in various clinical settings, both inpatient and outpatient facilities. And last but definitely not least, Peter Thomas, uh, coordinator for the ITEM Coalition. So the ITEM Coalition is a group of disability organizers, aging organizers, consumer groups, voluntary health associations, and nonprofit provider associations working together to address inadequate access to assistive devices, technologies, and related services. So this is a very, very broad and expansive different perspectives groups um, and I'm so excited to hear everyone's thoughts on standing and standing technology and I thought we'd kick it off with you Joseph and I wanted to hear from your perspective as a standing wheelchair user um, why should someone consider standing if I'm a wheelchair user and I'm just starting the wheelchair obtaining process why should standing be on the top of my list thanks Grant um, Gosh, there's so much that we tend to take for granted as human beings until it's, uh, you know, something we actually have to think about. And I remember even five years or so after my skiing accident that left me, uh, you know, paralyzed C5, C6 level quadriplegia, um, my primary care doctor encouraged me to start looking at my bone density. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I've always had strong bones. I'm not really worried about that. Um, sure enough. I should have been worried about that. Um, you know, found out a couple years later that I did indeed have uh, some significant bone loss due to sitting all the time. We're not, our bodies are not designed to be sitting all the time. I think we can all attest to that. Um, you just know when you're moving around how much better you feel. Um, and then if you are in a situation where you are sitting for a long time, you have all kinds of things um, come up. And um, once I was able to stand, thanks to Permobile um, and the, the chairs that they provide. Um, I definitely noticed a quite substantial difference. Not only was, you know, psychologically, it is very beneficial to be able to stand and see people at eye level and all that good stuff. I joke about, you know, being able to look down at people, um, but, you know, um, being able to stand has all kinds of health benefits for bone density, for uh, spinal alignment, for uh, decreasing spasticity, for um, uh, decreasing the frequency of uh, urinary tract infections, bladder infections. Basically, you don't have you know urine pooling as much as you do when you're sitting all the time. I mean, the list probably goes on and on um, about the health benefits of standing, and it's something that I really hope folks can leave this webinar with is the idea that standing, um, especially for a paralytic, is preventative medicine. And the cost savings are really there, uh, of course, for the families involved, but for the government, for the taxpayer, for, for uh, providers. Hopefully that answers. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a great segue uh, into, Nicole, your perspective as a clinician, all of those benefits that Joseph just pointed out. Could you, could you add to that and why you think standing might be great from a clinician, a clinical perspective, rather. Absolutely. Thanks, Grant. Um, yes, Joseph, you said everything that I kind of highlight. So when I'm either meeting my patients or have been working with them for a while, um, I give them that that ability to say, OK, tell me all the things that are actually going wrong, because that's what I need to know. So as they're listing off, I'm having pain, I'm having spasms, I am um, frequently in the hospital because I get these urinary tract infections. Um, 
I have swelling in my legs. So as a clinician, I'm thinking about, okay, what are the ways that I can help you manage those so that you're not getting into the hospital, so that you're not um, having to take additional pain meds? And what comes to my mind first is standing. And when you are able to stand, um, you know, physical therapists have been putting people in standing frames for forever. We know the health benefits that are out there. And we also know um, like you said, the, the social and the functional benefits. So if somebody tells me they have swelling in their legs and okay, well elevate them. Great. So now you're staring at the ceiling as you're tilted back and your feet are up, but that's not functional. That takes you out of whatever part of your day that you were trying to be active in. So um, as a clinician, it's actually my go-to. I'm trying to kind of figure out would you not be safe to stand and would this not work for you and so when we kind of go down that hole of yes this is awesome i think you would really benefit from it then we go through our process to to definitely get it for you that's that's really interesting how the clinical benefits can pair with the social benefits at the same time and joseph i'm, I'm interested to hear if you've had that experience where you're maybe doing pressure relief while at the bar right uh, d does that exist or is that just some made-up scenario in my mind? No, uh, I'm in Raleigh right now and in, uh, in North Carolina and there's an amazing jazz lounge, um, Tea Grace, that I frequent pretty often and um, I, I'm always standing there and no, it definitely does. If uh, yeah, There is certainly the social element. I've had, you know, I've been at um, concerts and things and um, the girls do want to come and, and dance with me more often when I'm standing. It's It's true. It's pretty funny. <laughs> that is too funny uh and so we we all know i think we can all agree standing is a fantastic technology and it isn't for everyone right but the people who it does work for it's just it's life-changing and so ashley i'm curious about your perspective of why sometimes there is a roadblock um to getting this technology yeah, you know, I think we we've heard already about, you know, the the medical benefits from Joseph and how clinically, you know, therapists are automatically kind of leaning towards that. But I think part of it is, you know, standing has been around for a long time. I mean, Promobile built their first standing chair in 1977. And so it's not a new technology, but I think the concept of standing in the realm of funding um, is a little bit to them, it's a little bit new. They don't have the same understanding of the evidence and the research behind it. Um, lucky for us in our industry, we have really kind of flipped the switch on standing and there's been a lot of research done in the last 10 years to support that and you know, trying to get just a little bit more you know, leeway with some funding sources to understand that you know, it's not just that social convenience item it's that medical benefit it's being able to now return home and access your whole environment um, at the level that your home was built for and you know being able to just return to those activities that frankly we all take for granted um, because we can stand up and access our world yeah that's it it it, it really is can it's amazing that the um, perception I've seen the shifts at least starting to happen to your point Joseph of um, taking the proactive approach just like we do with a lot of other our preventative medicine the smart drive is what I think of to prevent against repetitive shoulder injuries for example um, so Peter this has been around since the 70s right and, and I, you've been involved heavily with the public aspect of this the government side of things <clears throat> could you speak to uh, some of the things that you've seen change in the past 10 or 15 years to increase access to standing? <laughs> I, I wish I could. Uh, I, I see I see a bit of a dearth of uh, progress and activity and it's very disturbing. Um, I will tell you what we're trying to do about it. Um, and when I say we, I mean uh, led by the ITEM Coalition, the Independence Through Enhancement of Medicare and Medicaid Coalition. 95 organizations, um, all nonprofit, working to try to gain access, get, provide better access and coverage to assistive and devices and technologies for people with disabilities of all ages. And we've really focused on two, two elements of wheelchair 
movement and design. Um, recognition of coverage for seat elevation in power, and particularly in power, uh, uh, particularly in CRT, complex rehab technology wheelchairs, group three primarily. And the same function uh, or the same set of um, uh, um, devices, if you will, uh, for the standing feature. So just to clarify exactly what this um, approach is, we, we've submitted a national coverage determination request, uh, worked with clinicians and, uh, and physician groups and f uh, patient and, and uh, consumer organizations. We've met with CMS um, probably 15 times now in the last three and a half years. Uh, we submitted a, a formal national coverage determination for both of those features, um, in particular standing for the purposes of this discussion. Uh, and that has been accepted by CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, as being uh, accepted as complete. Uh, that now then means the next step is for them to issue this national coverage determination reconsideration request um, seeking coverage of standing systems for uh, uh, Medicare beneficiaries open it up to the public, release the, the NCD request, make it, make it publicly known, and ask for public comment on that um, request. CMS then takes back that public comment, they review the application, they make a preliminary decision, and they publish it, for again, for public comment. For, there's two public comment periods. Uh, and then they issue a final determination as to what the coverage policy will be for whatever's been requested. Well. When we really dug into this, we found that there was a tremendous evidence base. You talk about a lot of research over the last 10 years. A lot of it is, is compiled in this NCD request. Um, this request is 63 pages long. And again, it, it covers seat elevation as well as standing system, but 63 uh, pages long. It's supported by 60 national organizations. It's got over 330 footnotes. It's got 129 sources. Um, there's a there's an attachment that is a draft national coverage determination and a local coverage determination so that we walk through everything that would need to be done by CMS in order to provide coverage for these two systems. We even have a, a you know a, a cost estimate from a group in Washington called Dobson Devonzo that came to the conclusion that over a 10 year period, if Medicare covered these two features, it would cost only about $310 million over 10 years. That is not a big number for the Medicare program to cover. Uh, and it would, it would add so much value uh, to people with, uh, with mobility impairments and disabilities under the Medicare program. And by, by doing it in the Medicare program, that has immediate implications on private payers across the board. Um, many private payers defer to Medicare. They're gonna wait to see what Medicare does. And many payers um, are not are saying no to coverage now because Medicare simply doesn't cover it. They don't consider it primarily medical in nature, if you can believe it. They consider it a convenience or a luxury. Um, and by not being primarily medical in nature, they're basically saying that it doesn't meet the definition of durable medical equipment. And if it doesn't meet a benefit category, it's not covered. No one gets access to it. It doesn't matter. If it's medically necessary for an individual person, it's not a covered benefit. So we, we've asked for a two-prong request of CMS. First, determine that standing systems and seat elevation are durable medical equipment benefits. They qualify as DME. And number two, develop a coverage policy that provides them to beneficiaries when they're reasonable and necessary. Reasonable and necessary is the standard for coverage under the Medicare program. If we can get them to do that, we'll see a break uh, chink in the armor and we'll start seeing some significant coverage of systems across the country. Yeah, Joseph. That's that's the, with, you know, like obviously being someone who, you know, lives with this, um, I mean, what Peter said is exactly right. Um, I mean, I can tell you, I noticed there were a couple of months where I was waiting to get the actuators replaced on my chair and I developed a bladder infection, like when I hadn't had one for like two years like within two months, it definitely happens. And then, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was very blessed to be in a very unique insurance situation. Um, there's absolutely no way that I could have afforded, you know, this chair that I had or have had over the years. 
and absolutely for so many people um it is absolutely a um a medical issue a, a health issue and preventative medicine issue i can absolutely attest to that in fact uh, you know the uh, the ncd request that i mentioned uh goes deep into the evidence base and i want to give credit to the clinicians task force which is an organization that uh, permobile and many other wheelchair manufacturers and suppliers support um they're really the uh the 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 meat and potatoes of the scientific evidence base and and the people who really understand the science around this uh they contributed to this ncd and i'm looking at the uh, uh on my other computer here i'm looking at the um executive summary and let me just quickly tick through a couple of the medical indications for power standing systems there's medical evidence there's evidence-based medicine between, behind every one of the things I'm about to say. The, the impact on the musculoskeletal system, just putting weight on your joints and standing erect does incredible things for the body after, after remaining either horizontal or seated virtually the rest of the day. Joint mobility, muscle tone, strength, overall strength, bone density, bladder and bowel management, digestion and bowel management, cardiovascular and respiratory health, and standing and pressure management of the skin. All of those areas have very defined studies behind them. It's not a slam dunk, it's not 100%, it never is, but it's a growing and very persuasive body of evidence that standing systems are absolutely critical for some people with mobility impairments. Not everyone, as it was mentioned before, but if you're in a CRT power wheelchair and you have a, a permanent disability, you have a, a significant limitation in your mobility, standing systems can be invaluable. I, 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 was, I, rem I walk on two artificial legs, but I remember very well when I was 10, probably till I graduated from high school, I spent a fair amount of time in a wheelchair. It was a simple manual wheelchair with a sling and it folded up. But I can tell you how many times during the day when I, I was able to move when I got home and got out of the chair, but I can, I can tell you how many times my lower back pain, at 10, 12, 14 years old, my lower back hurt, my butt hurt from sitting on it for hours on end. Uh, I mean, the, the forget about the psychosocial aspects of being in standing and looking eye to eye. There's plenty of value there alone, but just the physical drudgery of sitting constantly without having really any relief to speak of uh it's amazing that they're calling this convenience and luxury it's offensive frankly and it really needs to be corrected yep i wholeheartedly agree and uh I, i'm hoping ashley or nicole you could speak to some of that clinical evidence that you've seen or worked with hands-on um and how that does kind of translate to the chair to the to our end user um something i've heard a lot about is the respiratory system, the how people have a standing regimen and they'll stand in the morning to open up their lungs and their chest and take a breath in the morning. Um, and that's something that's always kind of started the conversation in my mind of the power of standing, something that you wouldn't necessarily think of off the bat, right? So I'm curious if you guys have seen any of that or Joseph, your experience um, once standing actually gets, becomes an option for yourself. Do you want me to go, Ashley? Yeah, go right ahead. I'll let you take it. Okay, and also thank you, Peter, for shouting out the Clinician Task Force. Um, Ashley and I are members, um, actually on the executive board. And a little background from me, I'm a, I work in an outpatient clinic in uh, downtown Minneapolis. Uh, we're a level one trauma center. And so I've been doing physical therapy for over 15 years, but the last 10 years I've primarily focused on power standing. And so exactly what you just said, Grant, um, the first time that you get somebody into a chair that they can finally stand up in and see them take that deep breath. Um, I had a patient the other day who uh, we were doing a trial process to get uh, FIVS for, and he felt like, he's like, oh, he's like, my leg bag is full. And I'm like, that's fine, I'll empty your, you know, your catheter bag. And then he goes to stand up and I'm like, and you filled it again. <laughs> and so I'm like, just the, the ability to have gravity assisting. Um, 
um, for your bowel function, right? Like they go home and they're like, I had an awesome bowel movement. I'm like, we celebrate poop in our clinical world. Um, but the respiratory, the breathing, um, the circulation, I will never forget, I had a patient who got her FIVS and she had season tickets to the Minnesota Twins, which if you know in Minnesota, we're diehard fans of all sports, even though we don't do well in essentially anything except my wild. We're doing all right right now. But um, she went to the season opener and baseball in Minnesota season opener can easily be like 20 degrees outside. So she pulls into her accessible seat, she's got her chair and she stands up for the national anthem. First time that she can do that, she's thrilled. She goes to sit back down and she's like, Nicole, I was freezing. So I stood back up and I stood the entire game because it helped my circulation. I was able to actually help control my body temperature because everything was moving how it should. Um, so I think like those things that Peter had said too, it's not, it's not for everybody, but it's also not a convenience. This is us just maintaining our bodies and trying to be healthy. And it's, it's frustrating that we're still fighting this battle, but we appreciate everyone who is fighting this battle. Well, and I think to, you know, kind of to the respiratory point too, there's also some underlying things that I don't think we necessarily think about from even a clinical standpoint. I mean, on, honestly, until I had experienced it, I probably wouldn't have thought about it either, but just the impact on speech, um, being compressed in that seated position and not being able to take that full breath, um, you know, our, there's, you become very quiet. It's really hard to really vocalize and get your point across because you aren't able to take that deep breath. And so, you know, watching some of my patients over the years and even clients that I've worked with through Permobile go into standing and just how their vocalizations change and how they can start to become more prominent in their environment um, while it's allowing them to breathe better, it's also some of that functional component um, that we have to take into consideration as well. Uh, that That is just, I love stories like that. The standing to get warm, just it's, it's endless, right? The possibilities of what this technology can do for someone. Um, and it's so frustrating that this isn't recognized and covered more. And something I've heard in the past from people in our community is we need to bring as many individuals and types of people in to fight this fight together. We need as many people aware of this and working towards progress together, right? We all have to be on the same page. And I'm wondering if we could speak to what we could do, right? What can I do sitting in my home here to learn more about this or join in to get this more covered? What what can I do? It, does, is that fair to ask? Yes, it is. Who would you like to uh, go first? Well, I guess Peter. It sounds like you're you have an idea. It seems, <laughs> and then I, I would happily open it up to everyone to answer if there are some other ideas. Well, let me just say that you don't go to CMS and ask Medicare to develop a national coverage determination if you don't have the evidence base. Um, they still may nitpick the evidence, what they typically do in these circumstances with respect to uh, many kinds of assistive devices and technologies is they'll look at the evidence and they'll say, well, you've only had, you've got, you know, four studies and they all had between 20 and 25 people in them. That's, those are small sample sizes or a lot of these, uh, some of these beneficiaries weren't Medicare beneficiaries and they'll figure out ways to discount the evidence knowing full well that when you're doing a drug trial and you can get 20,000 people in your drug trial, that's, that's, not a, that, that's not necessarily a difficult thing. You just need to fund it. Uh, getting 20 or 25 people into a spinal cord injury study where you're studying standing, the impact of standing, that's, an, that's a formidable task. So um, there needs to be some accommodation for the evidence base. But let me just say that there is a well-written um, narrative and a well-sourced narrative that's available to everyone here. Uh, we published the NCD request. Um, it's on itemcoalition.org, www.itemcoalition, all one word, .org. And I encourage you to go to it. It's at the bottom of the uh, homepage. 
and you'll see NCD request and just click on it. And I'm looking at it right now. So if you're in a situation where you're a patient or you're a, a consumer or you're a clinician or you're a physician or you're a supplier and you're trying to get coverage of standing systems in your private plan, uh, Medicaid program, whatever the payer is, um, even Medicare, even there's, there is value to starting appeals and starting to put pressure in them to cover these systems. Go to this document, pull from the document. There's, it's not copyrighted. Pull anything you'd like out of the document to help make your case. It's cite to the, cite to the, um, to the, the medical evidence, to take what we've written and use it to your own advantage to try to argue for coverage of standing systems for as many beneficiaries as you can possibly argue for. Um, that's one thing. The second thing, and then I'll stop talking, let others speak, is when this NCD uh, request is actually opened, and we are completely besides ourselves that this thing has not been opened yet, but uh, we're working hard to do it. We had two letters from Congress with 77 members of the House, bipartisan letters, Congressman Langevin, who's in a chair, Congressman, Cong I'm sorry, Senator Duckworth, who's in a chair, both wrote to CMS. We've had extensive meetings with CMS to try to get this darn thing open. When it does open, we will announce widely an initiative to try to get as many people to sign a petition, to submit comments to CMS. It'll be very easily uh, accomplished. We'll have a website that's all designed, ready to go live. Uh, we're going to ask Permobil and every other manufacturer and every other organization in the item coalition to widely distribute um, this website link that you can then get on and then send it to your own network and communicate to CMS that you want this, this covered uh, and why. And that, that could be a decisive factor if they get an over, overwhelming response to CMS that this really needs to be a covered uh, technology, covered uh, system, both seat elevation and standing systems, they're much more apt to pay attention to this. So those are the two things that I would recommend. And that was the itemcoalition.org, right? That's correct. Okay. And we'll make sure to put that in our follow-up email so people can go check them out themselves. And just on that topic, I, we all know several people who've gotten standing wheelchairs covered by insurance, right? And we even got a question in the chat here just now that says, I've heard a lot of people who've had success getting their insurers, including Medi-Cal in California, who are successful in getting standing covered. How is this possible? And so what avenues currently exist um, to get these things covered? And is it a state-by-state -state thing? Yeah, I can definitely answer that one. It is it is a state-by-state. -state. There are states out in, you know, that in our country that do support standing and seat elevate, um, and they're kind of smattered throughout the United States. Um, and so in those states, it tends to be very spelled out how you go about the different steps uh, to get standing. And in some states, they're very, it just has to be very medical based. In other states, um, like my state of Wisconsin, uh, we fought for this a couple years ago and, and won it. And it was basically all on the function of standing and what standing could potentially allow for that independence of that individual. But in those states where we don't have coverage yet, I think, you know, to, you know, Peter's point, using that NCD request, using the literature that's out there um, and really never stopping the battle. You know, the states that cover it, it's because honestly, if you look back over the course of that state and that policy, it's because there was clinicians and equipment suppliers and clients and family members who didn't give up. They didn't stop fighting. They, you know, they kept just battering that funding source with every ounce of evidence that they had and ultimately won that battle. And so in those states that you don't have that definite coverage, um, I would say, you know, use everything you have. You know, Permobile has a wealth of resources um, for our Canadian friends, our territory sales managers, our educators up there are awesome. Um, give every evidence that you have and just keep fighting to get that covered uh, within your state. And even as, as the client's in the family members, your voice actually at times is way better than ours. Uh, and having those that information from you and those letters from you really can change it. it the, you know, 
it can change how things kind of roll through because they see that individual now as a true person instead of just a piece of paper and some information. Could, could I add to that just a little bit? Um, because I totally agree. And some some state Medicaid plans will cover standing systems. The VA covers standing systems with a actually developed a coverage policy. Uh, setting aside the VA, focusing on health, private health plans and Medicaid plans, the overwhelming cultural mindset of payers is to reward the wheel that squeaks and to figure out a way not to make this into a big cost item for the rest of their beneficiaries, the rest of their enrollees. So when you have someone that's really motivated to get this covered and they keep going back and they keep going back and they have the support of their suppliers and the manufacturers and others, they tend to get uh, coverage, but it's A, at great expense to them, and B, it doesn't apply to everyone else. It's a one-off. It's You get the sense that they're in the back room saying, say yes so that they go away and just they're, they're done and let them let the, let the next person fight their own battle. Um, it shouldn't be that way. It should not be pulling teeth to try to get basic, uh, in my view, basic um, technology for people who have permanent mobility disabilities uh, and impairments. There's There's just a better way to do this and it's to create a coverage policy that works that doesn't overutilize the technology but it provides it when it's necessary create this the 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 evidence based guidance for who needs this who would benefit most from it and and have medicare start set the standard by covering this technology and hopefully other payers will will follow suit and put pressure on your state legislatures for them to do that Yes, the, the Prone Build team will absolutely be sharing the Item Coalition links and messages to contact your local legislators. <clears throat> uh, Joseph, was your experience getting standing technology, getting that funded, was that difficult? Was there a lot of roadblocks? Uh, did you cite evidence uh, to show the medical need? So my situation was very, very unique. Um, don't really know how much detail I can go on to on it. But I do remember from like pretty much day one coming home from the Shepherd Center in Atlanta, which was an amazing place. And they, they have some advocacy programs that are wonderful. Um, in 2005, my, uh, which is now New Motion, my vendor uh, advocate, Todd Dewey, told us, and, and this was before I had the standing chair, we, had the, we were able to get a standing frame. And he made the point, and he works with a lot of people, and he said, it should be standard practice that no one is released from a re rehabilitation facility that deals with spinal cord injuries without some form of, you know, either a standing frame or a standing chair. Like he made that point flat out to us back in 2005. So this is something that's well known by um, client advocates and, you know, and vendor providers. It's just, I, it's a matter of money and, and, you know, making that case, I think in a, in a, in a big picture way for all, not just for my case, like Peter said, not just a one-off battle that people have to fight who have the means or the energy to fight it, because a lot of people don't have the means or energy, and yet they're human beings, and you know they shouldn't have to um, quite literally wither away and deter you know deteriorate because um, because someone is does not understand their situation the way that they do. Can I add to that, Joseph? Because you had an awesome point. Um, as a clinician, you know, the practice of getting somebody upright in a standing frame is pretty common practice. And what, um, and I used to do that, and sometimes I still do that because maybe it's the most appropriate piece of equipment. But what I was finding is that the effort, the energy um, to transfer into that separate device. And then once you're in there, and often it required a cyst of one, maybe two people. Once you're in there, you're stuck in one spot. You can't do anything else. So then it's like you're, I don't know, watching TV or doing something that's not as engaging. Um, and then 
depending on who's helping you get in there, maybe you can only do it once every like couple days. You can't get in there multiple times a day. Um, or the again, the transfer is just, it's cumbersome, it's painful. And so what I was seeing on that side was that there was a lot of equipment abandonment for those separate standing frames. So they knew that they needed those benefits medically, but it just was not feasible to get into it. And so when you incorporate it into the chair, that is your way of getting around your world, now you can get upright, you can stand for a couple of minutes, you can actually reach things, you can sit back down. And we do have research too that shows that those dynamic loading, instead of just the stuck static standing for a prolonged period of time at the dynamic, is actually better. Um, so it, my mindset changed in that. It's like, how can we incorporate this and get people to actually continue to use it? Um, and then I, I agree, like it's it's hard to have to be that squeaky wheel. And as a therapist who used to send all that research, I mean, I wrote the letters 10 years ago and I would send the resident position papers and I would just bombard my insurance companies and say, this is why they need it. I think they got sick of me. I don't have to do that anymore. Um, but I mean, that's, you have to find that person who's really going to want to go a couple extra steps for you. And as a patient, I appreciate when they tell me, yep, I'm in this, I'm going to fight. This is what I really want. Nicole, you jogged my memory and I absolutely attest to, because like I said, we, we had a standing frame and absolutely it would take, you know, a half hour or so, 20 minutes for two people to get me in the thing. And by then I'm like, I'm tired. I'm like, I'm just, you know, just like, it just, it was such a hassle and it definitely sat unused um, the majority of the time. Whereas with a standing chair, I stand every day for, you know, an hour uh, pretty much. Um, only reason I don't stand more often is because I work and I'm, you know, on the computer and it's a little bit hard to angle, you know, in my situation, but at night, you know, definitely an hour a day, I'm standing in the standing chair at least. Um, so yeah, it is. It really is night and day between um, the standing frame and the chair that stands. Can I also make a quick point about equity? Right now, the Biden administration has a healthcare agenda, and they're uh, completely devoted to healthcare equity, finding out ways to eliminate disparities in healthcare and and uh, really inculcate in our healthcare programs um, a sense of equity in, um, in the provision of healthcare. I can't think of a more inequitable uh, situation where a Medicare beneficiary clearly qualifies clinically for a standing system and um, doesn't have the money out of pocket to pay for it because the Medicare program won't. So because they don't have the resources to pay out of pocket, they don't get access to a standing system. And yet someone who does have money out of pocket can do that. And in fact, that's typically how they do gain access to standing systems is people pay out of their own pocket. Um, that's just blatantly in, you know, inequitable. And it's a prime example of, I think, something the Biden administration is trying to do something about. So I'm hopeful that when they do actually focus on this NCD, they'll they'll view that uh, that argument, this argument through that lens, um, and hopefully come to the right conclusion. I'm going to open it up for a sec to, to see if anyone wants to respond to this section of the conversation, and then I'm going to switch gears here on us if everyone's okay with that. Okay, so we've gotten a few questions um, about standing technology and the equipment specifically. So Nicole and Ashley, I'm hoping you can answer this one for us. Um, things that you guys have seen that limit standing from the very beginning. So issues um, that a client could be having or a diagnosis or something along those lines that just standing's not right for this person, let's not even go there, it is the idea of this question. So could you speak to that? Let me go first, Ashley. Yes, because I'm trying, I'm racking my brain trying to come up with a, a, an explanation of who would understand. Um, I, okay, so I will tell you that this is the number one, It's it's got to be a joint decision with your medical team. This isn't something that I'm going to be just like, yep, let's stand. And then you got a team of physicians um, and nurses that are like, absolutely not. 
Um, so that's that's the first part here. You have to be, you know, on a on a bigger scope, medically um, okay. Um, you know, I've had some patients where maybe we have to do a little bit longer trial and really get their blood pressure to tolerate. Um, if you've been sitting for many years and now all of a sudden we're getting your upright and we're standing you, it might not be that you can't stand, but we might just need a little additional time um, and getting used to that. Um, you know, bone density, this is always, actually going to say this, this is always a question we get. Um, do I need a DEXA scan? And do, what do my numbers have to be? You know, your bone density after sitting for a couple years could actually be higher than my bone density. Um, so if you and your team feel like, yes, you need to have a scan and you want to have a good number of whatever that shall be, I, I'm going to say, you know, most of those fractures that we see because of low bone density are actually happening when you have torsion. So that's usually when we have that, that twisting or that transfer or something, not the straight up and down that we're promoting with a sit to stand. Um, I guess if you're fearful, I mean, I don't, I don't know, Ashley, what do you, what do you got? I think. I don't, you know, I don't, to your point, you know, you definitely need to have your whole medical team on board um, because there are underlying things and there are a few diagnoses that are questionable right from the get go. Um, but the way that I've always looked at it um, is, the technology that standing power mobility systems offers and, you know, especially, you know, permobile standing, the F5 Corpus VS, we really can customize all of those stand sequences. And so we have stood people that, you know, people, honestly would go, how in the world did you guys manage that? And it's because we just got creative. We had that medical clearance from the medical, the whole medical team, um, and it wasn't their medical limitations. It might have just been a physical limitation, and the chair was able to adapt to that. And so, when I said I had to really rack my brain on on an individual or a certain diagnoses that we wouldn't stand or couldn't stand. Um, there's not one that sticks out because all of them are kind of it's a kind of a one-off situation where each individual might have something that throws it out and says, "No, we can't do this," or they may have all the factors where we go, yep, this is good to go. Let's program this chair. Let's be creative. Let's get you standing. Even though the world and your medical team said you're healthy enough to stand, but there's no way you're going to be able to physically do it. Um, so I don't think that should be a limiting factor, but it's definitely one that you need to talk with your entire medical team about before moving forward. I have a couple of quick questions for you. Uh, is there a weight over which you really would not be recommended for standing. Is there a cognitive element? Do you need a certain degree of cognition and a cognitive ability to, to operate as a standing system? And third, um, is there a, a need for a certain amount of trunk control or is that can that be accommodated through the device itself? The trunk control can definitely be accommodated. Um, you know, all the additional seating and positioning accessories out there. Um, I mean, the industry is, has tons of them. Um, and so that's definitely not one that can, is really, we want to rule out. Cognitive wise, it's really up to that medical team and the caregivers. Um, you know, sometimes there are those situations where there may be, they should be standing, but power mobility standing is not their thing. And that we might have to say, hey, you know what? We might can't do this, but we got we have a static standard, we have easy stand, we have you know the Riften standards. They're still we're still standing. It's still great. Um, weight wise, all of the power standing wheelchairs do have a weight capacity, um, and you know over a certain you know weight, it is going to be a little bit trickier. And in some cases, the chair just physically itself cannot handle that. Yeah, and to kind of add on that, which Peter, maybe you have this question, um, but you don't just have to drive with a joystick. I've um, gotten standing chairs for my patients who, you know, use their head, um, like a head array. We've done eye gaze. Um, We've done patients who are vented. So like the accessories that are available within our industry, um, it's not just a, oh, you have this, so you now you can't stand. I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever say that. Um, and then, um, shoot, I had another one. Go ahead. Nope. Lost it. <laughs> okay. I have a whole bag full. Um, 
Uh, Peter, real quick question for you. Do you have a timeline on the CMS determination? Uh, we've, we've had some questions about that, and I know you said you guys were working hard and it was it was a pain in your side, but I'm, I'm curious if you have an a insight into when that could be. I can tell you what the regulations say about once the NCD is opened, and that is that the, a typical time frame for a decision is six to nine months, and that's in the regulations themselves. But there's a big loophole in those regs. There's no requirement that CMS issue and open up the NCD once they determine that it is deemed complete. So right now we're in our 15 month, 15 month where CMS has deemed the NCD complete and they still have not opened it for consideration. It's just, it's just beyond uh, frustrating. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then back to Ashley and Nicole here. Um, what are some of the challenges or limitations of a standing chair in terms of its base or its footprint? So for example, is it a higher seat to floor height? Will it still fit under a standard table height? Um, will it work with easy lock systems for vans? Those kinds of things. Yeah, I guess I can take that point of it from Permobile standpoint. Um, our, the F5 Corpus VS, um, we can customize and drop that uh, seat to floor height and really dial it in to you as an individual, which means that we can, uh, you know, it can fit underneath tables. Um, it is a little bit with our, you know, the way our base is designed and the way that we access standing. Um, it is a slightly larger base. Um, and you know we want to just ensure that that base is safe and so it does it is a little bit bigger uh, for some individuals and so you know that's where you really want to have those trials um, that home trial to make sure it works in your home that it fits in your van it fits in your work environment um, or your school environment what have you um, as well as you know it may you know that may be the perfect fit or you may have to look at a different um, power standing device Thank you. I, was gonna Thank say, I think that's important um, just in general for any piece of equipment um, that is required, right? Like you should be making sure that you're doing an actual home trial. Um, I think actually following up in the clinic um, <clears throat> and making sure that once you get the equipment too, that everything is set up and you are loving that piece um, so it doesn't get abandoned. But, you know, making sure that when you are in your home or your school, or your work, that it is actually going to fit. And then that's just reaching out to your supplier and your rep and making sure that they can at least run it through so that you know when you get it that you're not going to be surprised by something. Could I ask a quick question? Uh, there, Ashley or Nicole. If you, if you're a wall walker, if you're able to get out of your chair and walk with assistance from walls or, or, or in your home, would you be, would, would that be appropriate? Would you be appropriate candidate for for a standing system, or or would you be quote unquote too ambulatory for to need that? Well, Peter, um, you're scaring me by saying you're a wall walker because I would tell you that's not what you're supposed to be doing um you but I know what that's, I'm saying, that's, that's realistic, that is realistic. Um, no so when I'm justifying anything for somebody I'm going to look at how independent how safe and how timely they're able to do any of their activities so mm -hmm. you might be walking on your wall and I as a therapist might be saying that's not safe um, but you're using your wall so that you're technically not independent and then how much time does that take you so you're trying to quick get out of a chair get over to the bathroom uh, no that's probably not going to keep you as somebody who's just walking so I would turn that around and say yes absolutely I think you're probably appropriate for a power chair um, depending on the um, Kind of how the words are spelled out for the qualification um, for a standing portion you know if you're able to stand unassisted for a significant amount of time then maybe i wouldn't think potentially of getting power standing integrated into the chair but for the most part again you have to be safe and you have to be independent with it so if yep. getting into that chair and standing you up now gives you hands free to wash your face do your dishes to cook that's going to increase your independence and your safety and then your timeliness. Does that yep. answer? Thank you. Yes, it does. Thanks. 
And I'm just going to take this opportunity to quick shout out the Abilities Expo as well for um, experiencing mm -hmm. products, having them all in one roof. For example, we got to bring a prone wheelchair into a Braun Ability van and test that out at the last Abilities Expo. Mm -hmm. So I know that's not at home, but those are great events. Uh, find one in your city if you're listening because they're awesome. And we'd love to see you there. Um, another question from our Q&A, from our live Q&A. So if you guys do have a question, please feel free to ask away and we can try to answer it in this with this group. Um, a question about uh, funding for us. <clears throat> Advice um, for how to get standing covered by insurance and how to best work with funding sources so they understand the need for funding. So I think this person's trying to say, what resources are available that I can pull from to prove my need for standing? And I'm hoping there's something that we can point them to out there. Oh, there's a ton. Um, and I won't continue to just steal the spotlight on this so everybody else can pipe in. <laughs> um, Peter pointed to the NCD request. Um, Resna, which is the Rehab Engineering Society of North America, has um, a couple different position papers on standing. Um, and Permobile um, ourselves, we have um, a white paper that we put out last year with all the medical and functional benefits and some of the research that, well, actually all the research that we could uh, pull uh, regarding that. Um, and there's also some stuff on some psychosocial benefits, which we know unfortunately in the United States is not a well-received um, benefit, which it really honestly should be. Um, and so there's a lot on top of that, you know, Permville has a lot of different resources and I would encourage you to, you know, from a clinical standpoint, reach out to your Permobile rep or your clinical education manager and we can start to point you in the direction um, that you need to go because there's, it's kind of like opening a can of worms. Once you find one, then you start finding more and you start finding more and, you know, the research and the evidence that we did with the NCD request, there's, I mean, it was lots and lots of articles that we pulled and read through to really, um, support what we were saying. The only the only one I would add to that is last year as part of the clinician task force, I did work with NCART. And so if you look at the NCART website, we also have um, just in general a standing justification document that was initially to respond to a couple states that were denying standing coverage. Um, but that was something that we published to give exactly that question grant. It's just kind of where can we find it all in one spot? And that is listed on the NCART website. Perfect. Uh, we'll, we'll make sure to include that link as well in our wrap up email. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for joining us today we're ra as we're wrapping up here. Uh, I know I learned a lot and I know I enjoyed the conversation that I'm so gracious to be a part of. And I wanted to just share this last comment that we got in our chat uh, as kind of a final thought, maybe. So Joseph's ATP actually chimed in. He's He's been listening and said to us, uh, one of the most important factors with successful third-party funding approvals for these complex solutions like power standing is the self-advocacy from the client themselves. Joseph is a testament to that. So thank you for giving us that little insight and a great shout out to Joseph well-deserved. Um, I'm going to open it up to you guys for any final thoughts uh, before we take off here. I'm just glad that uh, that Permobile is talking about this issue and, and in a sense laying the foundation um, for a strong advocacy campaign when this NCD actually does open up. We're, we're, we've, we've done the homework collectively. We, the field has done the homework. We're, we're ready for consideration, and once the uh, once the curtain is opened on that NCD, we really hope there'll be a flood of positive comments to cover these two systems, both C elevation and, of course, standing systems. Thank you yep. for and, to this. Absolutely, and stay tuned. Uh, if you guys are connected with our social media or our email change, we'll be promoting that as well. I'm I'm certain of it. So if you're not connected with uh, uh, Peter's organization, you can just stay connected with us because we'll be supporting them. <laughs> All right, uh, Bren Lee, am I uh, missing anything here? Are we ready to sign off? Yeah, just are there any other final words from any of our other panelists? We have about another, you know, a couple minutes. If you guys want to say a final word, then I'll do a conclusion. 
I, I am never short of words. Um, I just want to say, you know, like kudos to Joseph, um, because as a, a patient um, or anybody who is listening, it really does take just going and questioning your therapist and your supplier and saying, I want to stand to help me to get that way. Um, and then as a therapist uh, who are listening, I think, you know, it, it does take a little work and it can be hard at first, but there's really great resources out there. And I would just say to not give up because it can be done. I didn't think that it could be done years ago and now it's just, it's my go-to. So, um, you know, the ability to change somebody's life is pretty cool. And I think that we need to kind of band together and really continue to try to do that instead of sit back and say it won't get covered. It can. So. Awesome. Joseph, any last words from you? Yes, I'd like to thank uh, Permobile and the panel. Um, this really is life changing um, for people. And, you know, I'm one of the few that have been blessed to um, have this, you know, life changing experience. Um, there are so many others who don't have an advocate, like Todd Dewey, who gave me a shout out in the chat there. Um, if you work with New Motion, uh, you, you should hit him up. Um, but also the rest, you know, Permobil team. I got to meet the uh, guy who assembled my chair one time at the at the headquarters in Nashville. That was pretty cool, and you could see his face light up. And I don't remember his name, but but it just you could tell it made his day to see it. So this really is a matter of um, a matter of uh, improving people's lives and, um, you know, having a little empathy for others who don't have an advocate for them. Um, it needs to be part of the conversation. And we do need to start thinking about these long-term uh, situations uh, differently for folks who, um, you know, don't have the same kind of access that someone in my situation did. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. This was Fantastic. Uh, thanks, Grant, for facilitating. You did a great job. Uh, we did record this webinar today, so everyone who is pre-registered, you're automatically going to get a link to the recording a couple of hours after we close this down. It'll also be posted on our Permobile Academy section of our Permobile website, like all of our other monthly webinars. You will receive a follow-up email about an hour after completion of this webinar, and for those of you who are on right now, the email will include a link to generate your certificate of attendance, as well as a link to a survey to provide feedback and share any new webinar ideas you'd like to suggest to us for the future. If you go and finish up the survey, you'll also be entered into a draw to win a Rojo LTV cushion. That's cool. I'm just gonna switch my slide. And we do want to invite you to our upcoming webinar next month that will be highlighting our smart drive and the fact that the smart drive is now compatible with the Apple Watch. And we also have our new push tracker E3 and that will be on March 24th, 12 till one central time. So please join us then. We will get back to everybody via email if we haven't gotten to your questions today. Thank you, panelists again, Nicole, Ashley, Joseph, Peter, and thanks, Grant, for facilitating. This was fantastic. So everyone have a fantastic day. Stay safe out there, and we will see you at our next webinar.